Hello, everybody. Well, this is where we last left off and uh, talking about direct variation and looking at the basic uh, slope intercept form, even though we haven't talked about it yet. Um, the way we're going to do this uh, is a little bit uh, interesting, I hope, um, because what we're going to do is we're going to introduce the slope intercept form uh, using functional notation. So the slope intercept form. of a line is given by the function f of x is equal to mx plus b. Now, there's a bunch of stuff here, right? So let me say a few things. <clears throat> the most important equation you will ever know is y equals f of x. They are exactly the same thing. What we are saying here is an output, but now we're giving it a special name. This name means the function with respect to the input x. So we can have lots of these different names. Uh, but if you write down a lot of y's, you're going to have a lot of problems. Okay, So we use y and f of x interchangeably. I could have another y, say y sub 1, and I could call it g of x. That would mean that there's a different output in a different function, g, still related to x. But our focus right now is on the slope-intercept form of a line. And what we're saying here is the function with respect to x, so the output as a function of x, is given by the product of the slope in the input and some y-intercept, some out Put intercept. And you'll see what I mean by that in a moment. Okay? So when we look at this, we can go back to the old ways of saying y equals mx plus b, but remember, y is f of x. Now, in other words, I started to already put a few of these things together, right? This means our output with respect to our input. Now, slope, m, is our slope. And the way that you really want to think about it, and the way that I always do it is, m is rise over run. We're taking some constant rate of change of our x, which is our input. And the B is specifically our y-intercept, or our output-intercept. Now, when we talk about the y-intercept, that means that at x equals 0, we have some output. Okay? So we're going to pull all that together real quick. Okay, and here's how we're going to do it. Just as, a re just as a reminder, if we go and run six units horizontally, right, and we make a point, then that point is now called 6 comma 0, right? We've moved six units in the horizontal and zero on the vertical. If we now go vertically up from that point, we end up here at the point 6, 6, because we've not only moved over 6 in the horizontal direction, but also 6 units in the vertical direction. Remember, we called this our delta y, and we called this our delta x. 
Okay, so let's do a couple base examples of these real quick. When we have b equals 0, we have our direct variation. So when we look at this and we can say maybe f of x equals mx plus b, but if b equals 0, then really looking at direct variation. Okay. Remember, that means it would look something like this. What we did was we took y equals kx, right? But now, under our new notation, we might call it f of x equals kx, okay? So you'll see why this notation is, is, is very powerful, okay? Um, and hopefully you might see it a, a, maybe right now. Um, let me just do it this way, actually. A lot of people don't like it this way sometimes when I show it, but we'll see. So in other words, this is our input, x, and then we have another component, remember, that's our y. That is our y, but it's also a function of x. So when we were talking about points before, we now have to extrapolate or interpret, and we have to interpret this information a little bit more. So just so we have an overall picture, a point is just a basic location in space with no dimension, but we call it some x and some y. That tells us that we're moving in some horizontal direction, then some vertical direction. What it also says now by our new notation is that we have x comma f of x. So our input and our output are both an, a function of that input, if that clears it up. It might make it a little more... Well, you'll see in a moment, okay, when we put it all together. And remember, this specifically means input. This specifically means output with respect to the variable x. So, let's just say I throw a basic example at you, okay? And let's just say we're not going to graph anything. We're just going to do some basic, what we call, evaluations. Okay? So a basic evaluation is when you know your input and you, put, you plug it in and you get out your output. Okay, so what we're going to say here is this. We're going to say or ask, can you please find the output when x, your input, is 2 using the function, fcn is my, my little abbreviation for function, f of x equals 2x plus 1. Now, all that's saying, okay, is that we have to plug in 2 for x and get our number out. But you'll notice that there's a little bit of a change in how we report our answer or our solution. You'll notice what I did here. I just took out all of the x's and then made ready for a substitution. What I'm going to do is I'm going to recopy that just so I leave it there. Okay, so you can see that you, you really want to do this all the time uh, while you're beginning. And now note that the x value, our input value, is 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to actually do the substitution. When I do the substitution, this is an evaluation. Now, when I do the computation, we evaluate. So what I'm going to say is 
the output associated with our input of 2 is equal to, of course, what? 2 times 2? 4 plus 1, 5. This is how we want to record our answers when we start talking about functions. But it's no different than doing what? Taking out all the x's and putting in 2 to find your y. So the power of this notation is very important because it tells us our input and it tells us our output. So, it actually tells us our point, which is 2, f of 2, right? Which is, in this case, 2, comma, 5. Right? Because f of 2 is 5. So, that's how you do a basic evaluation. Now, if I wanted to do a basic graph of this, okay, and this function uh, 2x plus 1, you're going to note a few things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing here. You Well, I'm going to use the same uh, uh, problem. So let's call this example 1 here, okay, and we'll call this like example 2. And what I'm going to do now is ask you and ask us, to find the slope and the y-intercept for the given function. f. So f of x in this case was 2x plus 1. Well, if we remember our slope-intercept equation, then it becomes quite clear to see that if we line them up, m is really 2, so the slope would be equal to 2, and the y-intercept would be equal to 1. Now, the y-intercept is a point, so we have to keep that in mind. This is really a point, right? So, this tells us that we cross the x, uh, sorry, we cross the y axis at 1. So, when the y is 1, we cross the x axis. Well, when we're on the y axis, the x value is 0. So, in this case, we know that our y intercept is at 0, 1. Not just 1. 1 means vertically, but remember a point is in two-dimensional space, okay? And remember that this tells us really how to move, so there's really, right, there's really a little 1 underneath that because any number can be divided by 1. So if I took all of this and I just wanted to do a humble basic little graph here and be like, yay, here's my little graph, then I'm going to do what I showed you before. I'm going to begin here at 0, 1. So I go up one unit, and now I'm going to label it. So 0, comma 1. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go up two units because that's what it tells me to rise. It says go up one unit, then two units, and then go over one unit from there. So this right here is your run, remember, and this right here is your rise. So now, we know that our next point is right here. And that point is given by 1, 2. You can count it graphically uh, and easily on the Cartesian plane, but let's see if that actually holds true, right? Because if it doesn't, then something weird happened, right? Because it shouldn't be at 2. 
right? Right? No, we'll just we'll play around with you. Come on. Ready. So we'll do it out. Here we go. Let's do it out in fuchsia or hot pink. F of 1 is equal to 2 times 1 plus 1. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Did we get it right? Did we? What does this mean again? This means that we are now at a point 1, 3. So, oops, accidentally put 2 because I went up 2, right? Because I was just thinking about the rise. But it's really what? Adding 2, just like we said, to our original what? Output. So, hope you caught that and said 3. You guys okay? So the point being is, is that you can see where you're at, count it easily, look at it, make sure you're in the right place, and understand all of the concepts that are in between. So I wasn't trying to confuse you so much, but I was trying to make sure you were thinking out loud. Because how many points to find a line? Oh, two. If I can get that really nice. Yeah, there we go. And now we actually have a line. Does it follow the pattern? Of course it does. If I zoom in, you can see that I go over one unit, and then I go up two units, and now I'm at the point one comma three. Now, you can make that mistake very easily, the one that I made, right? Because we did oopsie, oops, right? But we caught it. So, what major points do you want to take away from this? We know slope. We know it's a constant rate of change. We know that it's a constant proportionality or a change in that constant proportionalities. We now know that we can begin at certain values of our outputs, which means that all we're doing is moving things up or down on the vertical when we're talking about outputs. The slope itself gives us a ratio or proportion of rise to run. And I hope I showed you that by making the mistake of looking at 2, not to confuse yourself and actually count. Because when I did it, I said, oops, I think there's something weird. Now, when we have all of this together, I'm hoping it makes a little more sense. Now watch. Let's do another base example of one of these linear types of functions. And let's, let's make sure we call it something different than f this time. How about that? Okay? So, how about I have an example here, and I say, oh... Let's just, you know, since we're going on this phase, let's, let's graph g of x, which happens to be, oh, I don't know. Let's, let's make, you want to make it a nice easy one again? Nah. Let's, have, let's make it one-fifth x minus three. How about that? Well, let's do some identifications. The first thing you want to identify is the y-intercept. But no, it's not in the same form as our y equals mx plus b. So, do yourself a favor and read exactly what's there. b is negative 3. That means that we have a point 0, negative 3. And then, what are going to move in a way where it says move 
one positive, oh, whoops, sorry. Yeah, move one positive upward or in the vertical, then move five in the positive horizontal. Okay? So, if we put all this together, zip, zip, I just now know that I have a point which is 0, negative 3, so I go 1, 2, 3 down. There's my point, 0, negative 3. Uh-oh, and then I began there. Whoa, I began there, so I'm beginning. I'm beginning right here at the y-intercept. Woohoo! And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to move now. But how am I going to move? It's rise over run. So I'm going to go up one unit from that point. There's one unit. And now I'm going to go over five. One, two, three, four, five. Were those two, right? Were those two meet? That will be my new point. And that point. Now, let's make sure I don't, I don't confuse you or upset you or, or, or try to trick you using any types of chicanery we can. What point are we at now? That's right. We moved over five in the horizontal. One, two, three, four, five. But we also moved up 1. So that should be negative 2. Now, be, I, I picked this one mainly because uh, just, you'll see. I, I hope. Let's see. Can I check it? Can we check it? Oops. And then you tell me if we're right or wrong? Is that a possibility that you could tell us whether or not you were right? Well, let's take a look at this. Let's say it's g of x, right, which equals 1 fifth x minus 3. But we now know that we have a point 5 comma, negative 2. If it follows the same pattern, then the pattern should be equal or be somewhat provable, if you will, within this context. So I'm going to now just erase those two, 5 and negative 2, and I'm going to give them different colors. Okay, so 5 was blue, right? So how about I give it green? There's 5. And how about the negative 2, right? Let's make it, I don't know, uh, eh, blue. No, blue would go with too much with that. Let's go with red. So negative 2. So now what we're going to do is check. So I'm going to take all of the x's out. And now I'm going to plug my input in. And my input, remember, is 5. So I'm going to plug 5 in here and 5 in here. Now, you might be screaming at yourself going, Why is he doing this to me with fractions and everything? Ah! Well, just as a side note, remember, fractions are your friends, right? They're, they're not so bad. If I had a fraction that was 2 thirds times, I don't know, one-fifth, then how do we find the product? We just multiply straight across. Two times one is two. Three times five, 15. Now, remember that every whole number 
always can be divisible by 1. So in this case, I'm hoping you can see that I'm taking 1 fifth of 5, which is 5 over 5, which is simply 1. Well, wait a second. That just turns around everything, I hope. So g of that 5 is now going to be equal to 1 minus 3. And let me put that in the same color that I had. That was 5. And actually, what I should do is use this same color here now as the pink as 1, right? Because that's what we came up with. So if I have one positive and three negatives, I have more negatives than positives. And in fact, I have, what color should we use? Red? Negative two. Right? And if you have trouble with this, let me make another side note right here. What we're saying when we say one minus three, okay? When we say 1 minus 3, remember, subtraction is really the addition. Oops. Of negative numbers. Okay? So I have one positive and three negatives. The positive and negative will cancel out. That leaves me with two negatives. Therefore, the answer is negative 2, which is clearly what we have. You guys okay? So, fractions are really your friends, and now, if I go back, I can connect the dots, la la la. Connect the dots, la la la, la la la. And make my line. So, I've done a lot with you right now, um, and we're going to get into more depth, but I'm hoping you start to see the understanding of why we in mathematics use this notation, um, because it gives us the point in question very easily, okay? And then we can use that to graph and find a model that might fit some unknown number or something that we don't know and find out, oh, wait, it does exist, and we can figure something out about it. So it gives us a way to find solutions that fit a linear pattern. So this gives us a way to find solutions to linear-based problems. Okay. I'm going to leave you off with one last thought, <clears throat> and that is why I don't like to memorize any of these formulas and stuff, and I just want you to see something. Okay. We know slope now is delta y over delta x, but let's say we always now know that y is f of x, which is our output. So if I asked, could you solve for delta y, could you? Yes. Now, remember, math in its most base, basic terms is a language of opposites. Okay? And that's the key. So, when we are doing this, read where the variable of interest is. So, the advice is read where the variable of interest is. lies. So in this case, we can see that we have a left-hand side equaling a right-hand side. So we're looking to solve
for delta y. This is only a one step. So let me copy this real quick. And put it right there. And then note what is going on on the right-hand side. Well, on the right-hand side, it says take delta y and divide it by delta x. So the opposite is multiply by delta x. So we're just going to multiply both sides by delta x. Now we know that we can cross those out, correct? And we have m delta x equals delta y. And in our next, oops, in our next episode, we'll sort of go into more depth of what this is, but I'm going to tell you that this is the point slope form of a line. Okay? And I'll let you play around with it. Maybe you can come up with and change the delta x's and delta y's into something else. Because remember, the delta means a difference between two things. Delta y means a difference between two y's or outputs. And delta x means a difference between two inputs. So those are the base concepts of where we're going and how we've been doing. Okay, We're pulling all of this information together. All right? So hopefully that helped. Let me know. Um, hope everybody's doing okay. And bye!